So what Newton's law says, basically, is, uh, well, there's a, a few laws of motion. We'll talk about all of them. But the big fame, the one that we're going to use to solve tons of problems is F is equal to MA. So this is the force on something is equal to the mass times the acceleration. What this thing says in layman's terms is that if I push something with a force, like if I push something, then it, it has mass, obviously, because it's made of matter. If I push something, then it must accelerate. That's all it says. It's common sense. You know this stuff. I mean, physics seems really difficult, but you know this. You know that if you push something, it's going to accelerate. If I have a bowling ball and I'm forcing it, I'm using my hand to impart a force, then it's going to leave my hand in motion. And as I push it from rest, it's going to have to accelerate, which means it's going to speed up from some non-moving velocity up to some speed, right? So this F equals MA is going to be used to, to solve a great, great, great many problems. And then after we talk about Newton's laws for a while and solve tons of different types of problems, we're going to talk about Newton's law of gravitation, which is a really big deal, obviously, because we live on Earth and there's gravity here. What does this mean, though? If we have a planet, we're going to call it Earth, and we have a, a moon here we call M. So the Earth has some mass, we call it M1, and the moon has some mass and we call it M2. What Newton figured out is there's a force that exists between any two pieces of matter. It exists between you and your pencil. It exists between a lamp and television. It exists between the Earth and the moon. Any two pieces of matter pull on each other with some force of gravity, and that force, if the distance between these two things we call r, that force of gravity is equal to some, some number g, which we'll talk about. It's called the gravitational constant. Time mass 1 times mass 2, so we're multiplying all the masses together, times g, this number. And on the bottom, it's the distance between them, but squared. So you might hear this called the inverse square law, or something like this. So if the Earth's mass gets bigger, M1, then the force is bigger. If the Moon's mass gets bigger, the force is bigger. But if we increase the distance between them, like if we stretch out the Earth and Moon even bigger, then since it's in the bottom, we're dividing by a bigger number, so the force actually goes down as we make things get farther and farther apart. So this is called the universal law of gravitation. Now, we, all are, we actually know now that Einstein, hundred, a couple hundred years later, uh, released and, and invented his theory of gravitation, and his theory of gravitation is actually more correct than this one, but still, this is a really good starting point to understand gravity, and we're going to solve lots of problems using Newton's form of gravity, because it's a whole lot simpler than Einstein's theory of gravity, which is beyond the scope of this class. But just keep in mind that, you know, this was accepted fact for 250 years or so, and now we know that it's not quite right in some, in some instances. And in the early 1900s, Einstein published a theory which totally reinvented how we look at gravity completely. But you might ask yourself, if, if I push on something, it's going to accelerate. Then if there's a force between the Earth and the Moon here, shouldn't the Moon come crashing in to the Earth? Shouldn't it come crashing into the Earth? Well, of course it should. Absolutely. And that's the famous thing, you know, Einstein, I mean, Newton sitting, sitting under the tree and watching the apple fall and having, who knows if it's true or not, that's the story, right? He realized that the Earth is pulling on the apple and the apple falls down. He realized maybe the Earth is pulling on the moon with the same force. Well, then why is the moon not crashing down like the apple? That's the real question. But he thought, well, maybe it's possible that gravity is extending all the way to the moon and pulling on that. And the answer to the question is, it is pulling on the moon, and if the moon uh, were not moving, it would crash into the Earth. However, the moon is actually moving. It's moving sideways with some very high velocity v. So it's going round and round and round. It is being pulled in, but it's going so fast in the horizontal direction, for lack of a better word, ten, it's called the tangential direction, that it never really hits the ground. And you say, how is that possible? Well, I have a little prop here. It's not a great prop, but it's a little prop. So this is like, this is like the moon here on the end of my little wire. Well, if I take this guy and start spinning it around, what happens here? Well, you see it's going round and round and round and round, just like the moon is. But what am I doing with my hand in the center? Look carefully. I'm actually pulling on this thing. So what I do is when you start it off, you have to give, you have to start swinging it, right? Like I'm swinging it and then I get it to go around once. 
and then I go get, get it go twice, and then I, I then once it's going horizontal like this, I'm pulling on it. I'm pulling it straight into my hand, but it never hits my hand because I've given it a very fast speed horizontally like this, and that's basically the exact same thing happening with the moon. If the moon weren't moving at all, if it just stopped then it would accelerate straight down and hit the Earth. But only because it's moving so fast horizontally can we escape that. Now the next thing we learn in physics typically is the concept of energy. And I know that most everybody here has an idea of energy, um, but we're going to talk just a, just a brief minute about energy. So the best way I can describe energy is, or at least one type of energy, is a roller coaster. So here's a roller coaster, very high hill, and then comes down to the bottom and then a little bit like this and then maybe it just kind of does something like this. So there's a car, it clink, 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 gets to the top, very, very, very high, right? At the very top of this very high mountain, right, <clears throat> we say that it has a high potential energy, high potential energy. I don't have room to write out potential energy. But the reason it has potential energy at the top is because we're in a gravity field. So if you bake something very high off the ground, if you were to drop it, it has a high potential to, to accelerate down to the ground and to, to, to hit the ground, right? So to do, to do something, to hit the ground, to have to do some, uh, impart some energy into the ground. So we say it has a high potential energy here. So what happens is the roller coaster goes to the very bottom and all of that potential energy you have because you're accelerating when you get to the very bottom here, when the roller coaster starts to round the bottom down there, we say that we have a high kinetic energy. So we're gonna learn a lot about potential energy and kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is how fast you're moving. It's the energy of motion. So you know when you get to the bottom of the, of the, of the trough here in the roller coaster, you're going fastest. Up here, you're going slow. So you have very low potential energy here. I mean, sorry, high potential energy here, and it's all converted into kinetic energy. And then here, over at this part, what do you have? Well, you have medium potential energy, because you are a little higher off the ground, but not as high as here. And you have medium kinetic energy, because you're not going quite as fast as you were down here. You bleed off some of the speed. So one of the big, 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 big things we're gonna do in physics is we're gonna talk about the total energy of a system. And the total energy of a system, of, that moves like this anyway, is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. And the total energy of the system actually doesn't change because whatever I start the system out up here at the top is how much energy I have. It's just all in potential energy form. So at the very top of the hill, I have a very high potential energy, that's what the up arrow means, and I have a very low kinetic energy up at the top here. But then when I get to the bottom here, I have a very low potential energy because I'm basically at ground level, and I have a very high kinetic energy because I'm going really fast. So you see what's happening? Every time the potential energy gets high, my kinetic energy must get low. And every time the potential energy gets low, the kinetic energy must be high. So it's like a trade-off. I'm basically, it's like two cups of water. I'm pouring the water in here. Now the energy is over in the potential energy cup. And then I pour some of the water back in over here. Now the energy is all in this cup. And if I pour half and half, I have half of my energy in the potential energy cup and in the kinetic energy cup. That's basically here. So the trade-off between potential and kinetic energy can be used to solve tons of problems. And we're gonna spend many, many hours solving lots of problems involving potential energy and kinetic energy. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.